And I don't know if this was a concern for her, it was a concern for me, so uh, I wanted to make sure I was not talking to someone who looked like the Loch Ness Monster. And so uh, we emailed pictures back and forth, and so that worked okay. And uh, after we did this email thing for a little bit, I, I finally asked her for a phone number. And so she gave that to me, and I called her, and we, we talked. Uh, a few times on the phone and we'd have these long conversations and talking about all kinds of stuff and uh, finally I thought you know this is somebody I'd like to actually meet in person and so as I recall this was on a Wednesday night that I was talking to her and I said would you like to go out for dinner on Friday night and she accepted the invitation and we figured out where we we're going to meet and we were to meet on that Friday night I was very specific in fact, I was very intentional in asking her to go out on that Friday night. Why? Because that was the 13th of February. And I'm not concerned about the whole Friday the 13th thing. And so uh, that's not why I was wanting to go out with her on, on Friday the 13th. I was wanting to go out with her on the 13th because the 14th is Valentine's Day. And I just wanted to steer clear of that because I thought, if we go out on Valentine's Day, what exactly am I going to do? I mean, do I, do I bring her flowers? Do I bring her chocolate? Do I bring her a gift? Do I do a card? Because it's not like she's my girlfriend, I'm her boyfriend. This is just kind of getting off the ground, and I don't, want to, I don't want to do too much or too little. And so I thought, I want to very much steer clear of Valentine's Day. And so that's what we did. We, we saw each other on the 13th. And so uh, I, I was grateful to stay away from Valentine's Day, not only because of that, but because of this. I really think that Valentine's Day, I, I'm not a big fan of it, because I think it is effectively an arbitrary, completely made-up holiday. Guys, you should amen heartily at that point. Amen. Yes. I, I, I really think it's, it, it's kind of a fake holiday, and I believe it's a conspiracy. I believe it's a conspiracy between florists, Whitman's Chocolate, and Hallmark. That they perpetrated this on us to say that you, you need to and you must celebrate love on this day. I, I think that Valentine's Day is kind of an arbitrary, made-up holiday. But you know what? That's not the only one. In fact, I, I, I believe that New Year's is kind of the same way. New Year's Day. What, what really is different today than yesterday? If you're an Ohio State fan, maybe it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, maybe something's a little bit different. But apart from that, what really is different? You say, well, what we're, you know, it, it's it's the first day of an. I mean, the, really, the only thing that has changed today is the fact that we're using 2017 for the first time. But you know, we don't celebrate February the first. We don't make a big deal about ooh, it's midnight on September the first. But we make a big deal about, ooh, it's midnight, the first day of January of a new year. Now, in the scheme of things, essentially nothing changes, but we make a big to-do about it. I think it's difficult to argue against what I've just said. However, I do recognize this. New Year's Day, more than any other day, maybe it's because of how we've been cultured, how we've been led to think, it presents us on that day, on this day, with a sense in which we've got an opportunity to think about, and we will do this on this day when we won't on others, think about what it is that we would like to do differently going forward. I don't know why it is, we will do that on January 1st, but we won't do it on August the 7th, Right? There's something about this day that causes us to say, you know what, are, are there some things that maybe going forward, at least for this upcoming year, that I can, could, and should do differently? Some of you might have already been giving thought to those questions and have already made some resolutions and perhaps already are beginning to act out on those resolutions. But regardless of whether you have or have not, it's the first day of a new year. Never experienced January the 1st, 2017 before. Given this reality and given this opportunity, 
Not just as a person, but in particular as someone who says, I'm a follower of Christ. Is there anything I should be asking myself today? Well, based on something that we read through the words of Paul, I believe the answer to that question is yes, that there are some questions worth asking. Some questions I believe that Paul reveals in Philippians chapter 3. If you would look with me in your Bibles there today, Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to start with verse 2. Philippians chapter 3, starting with verse 2. Paul says this, Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, putting no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. In fact, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible... I may attain the resurrection from the dead. About what we've just read, it's helpful to have a little bit of context. These are obviously the words of Paul to a group of believers that comprise the church in Philippi. Now these are people that Paul knows personally because it was Paul that first founded this church on his second missionary journey. And in many ways, he's kind of like a spiritual father to them. He's the one that first pointed them to and told them about Jesus in the first place. And as a parent cares for the children, so Paul cares for this group of believers. And he's writing to them because he's concerned. And he's concerned because there are some threats that they are facing because of some individuals and with these individuals some ideas and some beliefs and some practices that have effectively corrupted the church. And the church's future is very much in peril. He says and cautions them in verse 2 to watch out for the dogs. New King James, I think, uses the phrase ravenous dogs. And as you will have and can have a pack of wild dogs that will come and make mincemeat up and shred something that is good, so too, Paul says, there are false teachers who have come in and been doing this among you. On one side, you had a group of people that were known as the Libertines. And the Libertines said this, Hey, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you've got a personal relationship with God, He has forgiven you, and so He's, in in essence, giving you a blank check that you can live however you want. I mean, truly, you can do whatever you want because you're covered by Christ's blood. And so, if it feels good, do it. It, No rules Everything is just right because you are signed, sealed, and just waiting for delivery. So you had the libertines on one side. On the other side, you had a group that, that Paul refi- refers to as the mutilators. And these were people who said, yeah, uh, you, uh, what, what is true that Christ has come and salvation is found in him, that is true. However, you need Jesus plus maintenance to and adherence to the Old Testament law so that for example if you want to come to Christ you have to have Jesus plus circumcision and so between these two extremes you've got the church trying to figure out what it is that they're going to do and all of these teachers are saying hey that Apostle Paul guy you shouldn't pay any attention to him whatsoever so they're undermining Paul's authority and he writes to them starting in verse 2 cautioning against this and then he says As verse 4 concludes, he said, If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. And at this point, point, Paul starts to effectively give to us and give to the Philippian believers his resume. He says, relative to myself as a person, first of all, I was and am a Jew, born of the people of Israel. 
beyond that, and, and with regard to the technical requirements of the law, he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day as the law prescribes. Furthermore, he said, I wasn't just a Jew, just not simply part of the people of Israel, but I was specifically part of the tribe of Benjamin. That's a big deal because it was Benjamin, that tribe, that Israel's first king came from. It was the tribe of Benjamin that would always lead the nation of Israel out into battle. The tribe of Benjamin was, was a respected tribe among the twelve. He says, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He's like, yeah, I was kind of head and shoulders above the rest because as it relates to the law, to all the requirements of the law, just to let you know how seriously I took this, I was a Pharisee. And so if there were ever people who were nitpicky about the details of the law, it was the Pharisees, and I was part of that group. And it's not simply that I was a part of them. He says, but if you want to think about zeal, if you want to think about commitment, driving passion for the law and for the Pharisaical traditions, he says, I took it so seriously that he says, I was a persecutor of the church. That's how seriously I took all of this. Concerning the law, both the law of Moses, the rabbinical law, Paul says, essentially, I lived in a blameless fashion. That's his resume. But then he says in verse 7, but whatever gain I had, I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. In fact, he says, I count everything as loss when compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Taken together, it's like Paul is, is trying to do some accounting here. And it's, it's like he's taking out a ledger book, and on one side, on the left side, he's putting all the debits, all the stuff that he would say is going to go into the no gain, no positive, no credit category. And what he does is to put everything that so many people in the first century, especially first century Jews, would have said, hey, that's good, that's praiseworthy. He says, I'm putting all of that over in the debit side of the ledger. All that's a loss. And the only thing that's going on the credit side is knowing Jesus. In, in, in truth, that's the thing that matters most to me. And everything else, when compared to it, he says, I essentially view it as a loss. You say, okay, Michael, that's nice. But you said that Paul's words here would pose us some questions worthy of answering. I don't see what the questions are. Well, here's the first question Where are you living? Where are you living? And by that, I do not mean what zip code, what address, what subdivision. Consider what's going on in this passage. Paul has, what he's just done is to give us his credentials, posting his resume. And this is all the stuff that's in the rearview mirror. Some of it is good, some of it's bad. But if you drop down to verse 13, Paul says this about all of it. Forgetting what is behind. Forgetting what is behind. So the question worth asking, first of all, again, is this. Where are you living? I know a lot of you are on Facebook, and even if you're not on Facebook, you're kind of aware of how it works. And if you're on Facebook, you're probably mindful of this reality. It's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, there's some good things that come with Facebook and there's some bad things that come with Facebook. On, on the bad side, there's at least some annoying stuff. I mean, there's, there's people that are, are posting constantly. It's like they are living their entire lives. On, that, that's, that's annoying to see that constantly on Facebook. Uh, we just finished this political season. You probably had more than a few political posts that you thought, yeah, I don't like that one. That's kind of annoying. That's kind of offensive. I don't like that. So, th so there's that type of thing on the negative side. And there's bullying and all kinds of stuff that goes on that falls in the negative category. On the positive side, though, Facebook kind of comes as a blessing because there are people that were it not for Facebook, People that you have known, particularly people over the years in the past, somehow along the way you got disconnected, and at least in, in this one small way, you're able to reconnect with them. That, that kind of comes as a blessing. And like for me, uh, there's some, some guys in particular back, at, from back in college that um, I've been able through Facebook to reconnect with. One of them is a guy named Rich, and 
Uh, Rich and I knew each other the entire uh, stint of uh, my four years in college, but we actually lived together, a group of us, a group of us in a house together. And Rich was really funny. We laughed and laughed and laughed all the time. We just had a great relationship. I thought a lot of him, but we hadn't spoken to each other, hadn't seen any, each other in over 20 years, and we reconnected on Facebook. And so uh, through that, I was able to see his profile and see that he's on staff at a church in Florida. And so I went online and looked up, this was back this past year, I, I looked up the name of that church, found the phone number, and I just out of the blue called Rich one day. And my call came as a very pleasant surprise to him. Again, we hadn't spoken in over 20 years. And so we, we started initially just by laughing, talking about some of the, the, the memories that stand out in our mind. We talked about our, our wives and our children I asked about his, he asked about mine, but then very quickly we were back talking about some of the funny stuff that we laughed at back in college. In fact, that's what the majority of the conversation was. It was thinking about and reliving all of these old memories. But in truth, that kind of stands to reason, doesn't it? We don't talk to each other. We don't see each other in the present. The only thing we've got is the past. You know, there are some people who live their lives with that seemingly as their mindset, that all that they have is the past. Sometimes it's a focus on good things. They think about the job they had, the home they had, the relationship they had, the money they had, whatever it was they had. And it seems all they can think about and all it is that they can talk about is what they used to have on the positive side. But then on the flip side, there are others who it seems all they can do is to think about the bad stuff that has occurred in the past. For some, it's the loss of health and maybe there was some accident that has resulted in a life-altering injury. For others, it's the loss of a loved one, someone who was so dear that was, was seemingly just taken, snatched from them in the prime of life and... All they can seemingly do is to talk about and relive and dwell on these past losses, these past pains. You know, it's very possible and very easy to fall into this trap. You know of people who have done this, but it's possible that you might have even slipped up and fallen into this. Based on what Paul says here, I ask you again, where is it that you are living? Is it in the past? And whether or not the past for you is an unbroken chain of success and accomplishment or a relentless stream of heartache, it doesn't change this reality. It's behind you. It's in the rearview mirror. You cannot change it, but you can do this. You can choose whether you live then or not. This is particularly important if you're someone who says, I've got a relationship with Christ, because very easily what can happen is that we think about our past successes, our past sacrifice, our past labors, our past involvement, our past participation, stuff that we used to do for God or in His name, and, and to say, boy, that was great. I used to do this. I used to do that. I used to do this. I used to be involved in this. I used to practice this. I used to do all of these things. That, that's all well and good. But what about today? You're not living back then. You're living today. So what about today? What's your walk with him look like now? What does your service look for him, with him, and by him look like today. You know, the the, the past can't be undone for good or for bad. It's behind you. You're not back there. So quit living there. And as a follower of Christ, answer this question, where are you living? Is it right now? And if so, Lord, to what extent am I giving you the ability to use me today? How do things stand between you and I, not back then, but right now? This day, I think, presents us with a significant opportunity to ask a couple of important questions. First of all, where are you living? Back then or right now? But Paul continues in verse 8. 
He says, For Christ's sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul, again, has just listed his resume. He's given to us his credentials. He's given to us his pedigree. And by virtue of what he has just described, we can know that what he experienced would have been very much the envy of many first century Jews. The social standing and economic state that he would have experienced as a Jewish leader, that would have been pretty significant. But now as someone who's following Christ Paul says this stuff doesn't matter to me Paul isn't trying to figure out how to reclimb the social ladder he's not focused on getting more money not thinking about how he can be viewed as respected by more and increasing numbers of people not concerned about gaining more influence he says that he's striving for something pressing for something and it's not the stuff of life Instead, he says what he wants. You see it in verse 10. That I may know him. All this stuff, and we'll talk more about this in a moment. All this stuff that Paul had, he's lost it. But Paul says, I don't care because what I'm striving for, what I'm pressing for, the direction that I'm headed is this. That I may know him. That I may know him. That leads us to the second question, which is this. A question worth asking. What is it that you are striving for? What are you striving for? You know, when people think about resolutions, New Year's resolutions in particular, there's all sorts of things that that wind up getting on those lists. Some want to lose weight. Nobody ever wants to gain weight. We ought to pick that one. That's a lot easier to do. But nobody wants to gain weight. We want to lose weight. Uh, We want to save money, buy less, save more, maybe read more, watch TV less, maybe go to bed earlier, be more well-rested, try to be more efficient, better use your time at work, better use your time at home. Maybe it's to start a hobby or to revive a hobby that you kind of walked away from in years past. Maybe it's to spend more time with family or to... Uh, reconnect with some old friends but there's tons and tons and tons of things that wind up getting onto the lists of resolutions for people as they think about the upcoming year but we're not just people if you're here today someone that follows follows Christ you're a Christian you belong to him and so the thoughts of him when you think about the future does he get on the radar screen of your of your mind You know, whether or not you have a stated resolution, the truth is that you are, and I am. We are all headed in some direction. And if you're here, though, as someone who says you're a follower of Christ, again, does he get on the radar screen of your mind? And is there a thought, a conscious, intentional thought, where you may echo the words of Paul, where you would say, I really want to know him. I mean, I I really know him the Lord now this is an easy thing to miss but I want you to notice what Paul says he doesn't merely say and express his aim to know the Lord in verse 10 he says specifically he wants to know the power of his resurrection sharing in Christ's suffering becoming like him in death so okay what's the big deal with that it's helpful to to just be honest for a moment about ourselves. The best person among us struggles with this. We all struggle with this, being self-absorbed people. If you think you don't struggle, you really are self-absorbed, right? We all struggle with this. And the, the temptation for us, and we come wired in, we come into this world wired thinking almost exclusively about ourselves and so that we want to make sure that we are taken care of and that everything is, is just fine and things are okay for us. Even the best among us still struggles with this. And this doesn't merely affect how it is that we live as a student, how we live as a parent, how we live as a spouse, how we operate as an employee. 
It affects how we operate as someone who says, I know Jesus. It affects the types of things that, concerning our faith that we may read. Concerning our faith, it affects the things that we may talk about. And even relative to our singing, it may very well affect and influence what it is that we sing. Let me give you an example. There's a, an old gospel song whose author is unknown. We, we don't know who wrote this song. In fact, I don't even know what year that it started. Some of you would be, in fact, particularly those of you older than me would know this song probably fairly well. The chorus says this. Build my mansion next door to Jesus and tell the angels I'm coming home. It doesn't matter who lives around me just so my mansion sits near the throne. You know that song? Anyway, I won't sing it for you. Could there be a more self-absorbed song? I, I, I'm grateful that we don't know who wrote that song because that person should be ashamed. Seriously, build my mansion next door to Jesus? It doesn't matter who lives around me, just so my mansion, my mansion is near the throne. Could it be more self-absorbed than that? I'm telling you that this very easily affects not simply our life, but it affects our mentality and how it is that we view our walk with the Lord. But notice what Paul says. He doesn't merely say, I want to know him and I want the good stuff because a self-absorbed focus says, hey, I want to make sure I'm taken care of. I want to make sure I'm comfortable. I want to make sure I'm okay. I want to make sure everything is okay in, in, in my sphere of existence. Paul doesn't just say, I want to know him. In fact, Paul doesn't just say, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. All that's the positive stuff. What else does he say? That I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in death. I want to know him in such a way that one day I may experience the power of his resurrection. I want to know him, yes, in that way, but I also want to so know him that I become so like him that that may even result in me experiencing suffering just like he experienced suffering. And as that brought about the end of his physical life, if for me, knowing him and becoming like him results in the loss of my life, I'm okay with that too. If I could summarize what Paul is saying, it's not just, hey, I want to know Jesus. I just want to know him more fully. I want to know him more intimately. He says, I want to know him. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I want to know him in such a way that I become like him and that my life is lived like his so that the good that Jesus experienced that becomes part of my experience but also some of the painful some of the adverse some of the suffering I'm okay if that comes my way too that's how much I want to know him you know, it's easy for us, if you're here as a follower of Christ, and, and, and to think about what Paul has just said in that light and through that lens to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to tip my hat to Paul. I, I, I've got to applaud that type of commitment. I've got to say, you know, that's a really good answer. Wish I'd come up with that one. That was, that's really, really good. It's not self-absorbed, it's Christ-absorbed. That's a really, really good answer. And it's not simply that I think we should applaud his answer and applaud his response, but we ought to do this. Ask ourselves, is that me? Is, is, is that me? And if the answer is no, the question is, wh why not? Why in the world not? Beyond that, why can't that be you? Why can't that be your aim? I recognize that today, at the end of the day, is just a, another day on the calendar. Maybe it's a new calendar, but just another day. But it is a day that, unlike others, we're more prone to pause, more prone to stop and reflect, to think, 
And as we do, there really are some questions as a follower of Christ that are worth our answering. Where am I living? What am I striving for? Not only are those questions worth asking, those are questions that already you are answering. Could it be that God is helping you to see today that maybe, just maybe, you may need to start giving a different answer? Will you bow your heads with me? You know, it's one thing to read these.